Well, thank you uh, again for, for having me and uh, I'm grateful to be able to share with you guys today. I'm going to be able to share just a little bit about some of my research that I did there at uh, at the seminary there as well uh, toward the end. But I but I have a uh, Mormonism is a big topic. I want to share a, a lot. I, I am curious I don't, and I don't know how much uh, you're able to uh, use the chat bar or anything right now just for for a minute or two um, might be possible but if it's not that's okay but I am curious to know how many folks that we have with us here have had a uh, an encounter with LDS missionaries or um, or have had other experiences with the LDS church I'm going to use the term LDS church today that's short for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, they prefer it as an institution that you use the whole title but that gets a little bit um, uh, belaborous. And so I'm just going to use LDS Church today. Uh, another word for the people who um, are from the LDS Church, another word for them is, are, is, is Mormon. Uh, that's a historical term that, that many have used. And so I'll use that term a little bit uh, as well. It uh, means people who have had experiences with or um, uh, are, are, are adherence to, to what is taught in, in the Book of Mormon. Um, so I see some of you have, Tommy, you've been a member, that's interesting, and uh, some of you none, some of you a little. Um, you know, South Africa has, I was just looking at the statistics here, South Africa has 68,772 registered uh, members of the LDS Church in South Africa, and they have, uh, and you have two temples there. And uh, that, that gives an indication you're the only, the only country in Africa with two temples. Um, not, not, uh, there's not a, a lot of other countries that have one, but, uh, but you do have two there, which means you have a little bit of an influence, a little bit more of an LDS influence there than maybe you might have in other places in Africa. So, um, well, I hope then that this will be an introduction to Mormonism for some of you and uh, to others, hopefully, that, are, that have interactions with people that are um, uh, LDS or you have missionaries that come, maybe this will give you some ideas of ways that you can steer the conversation to, uh, to reach people that are in that group for, uh, for, uh, for Christ. So let me talk to you a little bit about what I want to do. I want to share with you just really briefly a little bit about my own story. Um, and then I want to give you a uh, 10,000 foot view of the LDS faith. So very, very uh, small, you know, or very high up kind of broad idea of the LDS faith. I'm not going to go into detail on that today because I just, we're not going to have time. Um, but then I want to give you, uh, because what I want to spend more of my time on is, is number three, giving you a, a basic strategy for reaching LDS members. So if you have those missionary encounters or, um, or you go and visit the genealogical resource center at the temple there that you're going to run into and have opportunities to talk to people. Um, some of you have had friends or uh, or other things as well. Well, this is hopefully gives you some ideas of where to go or some things to to do in those relationships to help point them to uh, to Christ. So just to give you a, a little bit, um, my uh, I, I grew up in California and was serving at a church in California and wanted to uh, do mission trips to, for our college students. So I was a pretty large I was at a large church as the pastor that was over that age group of 18 to 25 year olds. And uh, I ended up taking our team on a mission trip to Utah. Now, um, Utah, I uh, knew was the kind of the heart of where Mormonism is situated. So um, Mormons uh, started in upstate New York with a man named Joseph Smith. He, uh, after his death, he, um, Mormons under the leadership of the next um, next person in charge, they called him the prophet. Uh, his name was Brigham Young. He Brigham Young led the the, the Mormon people, um, uh, really, you know, with hand carts. You know, so I mean, they just pulled all their belongings on a cart that they pulled 1,300 miles um, through pretty rugged terrain on and made it to Salt Lake City. Some of them had wagons, but most of them were just pulling their things by hand. And uh, so that's part of their kind of their history or their story. And when they came into Utah at the time, it was not part of the United States of America, 1847 or something like that. They ended up getting here. It was actually part of uh, uh, Mexico at the time, I believe. And they, uh, but it was, but, but then the, you know, the United States, United States purchased the territories and all that kind of thing. But 
but they when they got here um uh they planted or they 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 uh, started here in salt lake and so that's kind of where the epicenter of mormonism has been uh for some time uh, ever since so about 100 there in 1830s and um so so we moved we when we did the mission trip here i i was understanding that this would be where you'd find a lot there'd be a lot of lds people but i also thought that there would also be um a lot of christians here because it's a pretty you know the united states of america is fairly christianized i imagined that there would be a lot of christians here and what we found was that uh, many many cities did not have a christian church in them here and were only influenced by the mormon faith uh, and so because of that uh, really started to feel compelled and called to go and plant a church and be a source of salt and light in a city here in utah that did not have uh any uh, christian witness in it and so we planted a church in an area that that is uh, 85 to 90 percent mormon here in centerville utah which is just a little bit north of salt lake city and um, and we've been at it here for about 10 years so a lot of my uh, i've done a lot of research and thinking about the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and i want to kind of give you uh a, just first of all just a really a uh, high level broad view of what the what makes the LDS church the church and uh, part of that is because I, there's a challenge that Christians have in sharing the gospel with Mormons and here's the challenge if you were to take LDS um, theology and put all the LDS theology in their bubble and all the Christian theology in theirs there's this there's this area of overlap and if I were to ask you or the you know if, if we were to try to define what goes in the middle like what is it that we share in common theologically with people of the lds faith now there are some practical things that we hold in common with lds people like they do have a lot of the same um uh kind of moral uh ideas of what's right and wrong and, and that kind of thing so but if we get away from just the practical things like that if we were to talk about theologically what do they believe that we also believe what do they what do we hold in common with them theologically um, all that we can really say are that we share words, that we share the same words, but what those words mean to an LDS person is uh, very different than what those same words mean to the average Christian or to Christian theology. Uh, and so an LDS person, this is what makes ministry to, uh, to LDS people uh, difficult at times is that we sometimes use the same words that we're used to talking about with other people to introduce them to the Christian faith, and they just sort of agree with us. So we can talk about being saved by grace through the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, and uh, and that we want to follow Him and um, do the kinds of uh, you know good good compassionate things that He did. Now they might they might you know say all those same things, and then you might think, oh, okay, well I guess they're I guess they believe like me, but they don't. All of those words that I would have used, that I used the substitutionary atonement when I talk about grace and I talk about um, what faith in him looks like. You know, all those different kinds of things are actually, they mean something very different to an LDS person. And uh, and, and it kind of hides the differences. The, the fact that we use many of the same words um, hides the differences. Uh, the end reality of the LDS faith, as you uh, learn about it, is they, they have a very different concept of God than we have they uh, they have a very different concept of who Jesus is and they have a very different concept of the gospel and because of that they're uh, they're people who are living in spiritual jeopardy they're they're not in a saving relationship as uh, as the bible uh, explains how one is saved they're not in that kind of relationship with god and so there's a need for somebody to help them um, uh, change their uh, change their thinking on on the gospel and on Jesus and on who God is all those sorts of things so let me just give you a, a brief window into the LDS world uh, by introducing you to um, what the LDS sources of authority are but then the kind of the story of Mormonism kind of the larger worldview story of Mormonism so Mormons use um, four things that are called the the standard works. So the standard works are are uh, it's really a collection of four books that you can kind of bind together into this thing, which is called a quad because it's got the four of them together. And the quad has uh, four works in it. One, it's got um, the King James Bible in it, and they will say that they believe the Bible, 
uh, but they will also put this little line in there insofar as it is correctly translated. And they don't really mean translated, they really mean transmitted. So what they're, what they, uh, one of the core beliefs of Mormonism, as we'll see in a minute, is that, that Christianity, after the time of Jesus and the, and the apostles uh, died, became apostate. And, uh, and that, that really the Bible was corrupted, that many plain and precious truths were removed from the Bible, and so it needed to be restored. And so that those who, you know, uh, practice uh, Christianity based in the Bible um, that Joseph Smith didn't correct are in error and they're apostate and they need, they need to uh, get on board with, uh, with Joseph Smith and what he did. So they believe in the Bible, but they, and then they also have these other books, um, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine of Covenants. Uh, this, the, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price are uh, purported to be uh, other ancient books. Uh, and Doctrine of Covenants has a collection of uh, other revelations that God gave to, um, that, that's claimed to, uh, that God, uh, that they claim God gave to Joseph Smith. And they have those and a couple other prophets, but they, they have those kind of collected into a document called Doctrine and Covenants. And then we would add to those four sources of authority, uh, one more, which is continuing revelation. And that's a broad term. I, I left it broad there because it really, if you were to try to define all the sources of authority, it gets a little bit of a lengthy list. But the idea is, uh, for the Mormon, that the heavens are open today, uh, that God is continuing to reveal truth through uh, a prophet. And uh, God, um, uh, Joseph Smith claimed that God had appeared to him and had made him the prophet for the people in his day. Uh, but they also believe that God has continued to do that. And so you get, um, you get, uh, the, they have a, a person today who, uh, Russell Nelson, who they believe is their prophet. And twice a year, he gets up and speaks to the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and, uh, and tells them what, uh, the, what God is, you know, it's kind of like Moses on Mount Sinai. You know, what does, God, what does God say to me? And let me deliver that to you. That's the idea. And so they really are, um, look forward to those meetings where they can hear from their prophet. Um, but it doesn't go, it goes also beyond just what the prophet might say, because they also believe that uh, as the prophet and the, they have a group of people that they call the apostles, as that group um, uh, works, they, they also give uh, uh, inspired teachings through uh, materials that they distribute to the church for teaching and for education, all, the, all those sorts of things. So... Uh, so you get continuing revelation. And, and kind of the stories that weave throughout Mormonism is, is this first story of restoration. And that's kind of what I already alluded to, that they believe that the Christian church uh, uh, apostatized, that they were no longer um, teaching the true gospel, and that uh, Joseph Smith, um, yeah, when he was a little bit younger in the 1820s, he went out into the woods and was asking God which denomination is right. And apparently he claims that God and Jesus uh, appeared to him and that they uh, told him that none of the um, none of the churches were right. You got to start your own deal. You'll be the prophet. And so he restored um, uh, proper, you know, their interpretation here. They restored proper uh, beliefs about God, and he uh, uh, and Mormonism was born. Um, then they also believe in the this picture of what's what you might call Heavenly Father's plan of happiness. And so the the the, the general gist of what Mormonism is after is this, uh, they believe that, that, the, the, that your life and my life can, can be subdivided into different uh, periods. Uh, they believe that there was a time that we lived before we were mortal, before we lived here. There was a time that we lived uh, with our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, and that they were uh, in the spiritual places producing spiritual children. And so there was this, this kind of large family, you know, billions of kids uh, to, that Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother had. And, um, and that Jesus was the, was the first child they had, uh, but that you and I might be, you know, you know, 14 billion and nine, you know, or whatever the number might be. So we're, we're of the same kind of spiritual makeup of Jesus. He's just a little older than we are. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but. In, that, in the midst of that world or in that place, that pre-mortal world, you know, we lived and had, you know, personality and, you know, character, all that kind of stuff. Um, but in that world, God 
declared to his people a, a plan to make us like him. So the goal was that one day um, his children could have a relationship with spiritual children that uh, was just like his relationship with us. That, that one day we could be, his plan was so that we could be as omnipotent and omniscient as he is. And so that plan gets developed through uh, the next phase of our existence where he sends us to uh, earth to uh, learn and have the opportunities to be tested and learn how to, how to do well. And if we pass that test well, then we can become exalted to the same status that, uh, that God has in the, after we pass away. Uh, but there is this sort of this veil that exists that kind of keeps us from remembering that pre-mortal life with Heavenly Father and all the other spiritual children. Um, they also believe that in that heavenly place, when God you know, shared that plan with us, that there was another one of our brothers who's uh, Lucifer, Satan, who um, didn't like the plan. And he thought, well, some people might not qualify to get good enough. And so he said, why don't you just force them to be good? Why don't you just determine their actions so they all make it? And, um, and he actually had a little rebellion, they say, in the heavenly places. And there was kind of a war between the people that followed Jesus, who affirmed Heavenly Father's plan, the people who, have, who followed Satan and his plan. And those are who the demons are and this whole kind of thing, you know, the people that sided with Satan. So um, there's a lot there uh, going on that I'm not going to get into. But, uh, but the idea is that in the life to come, after we pass away, if we follow Joseph Smith's teachings and the rituals that he gives us, so Joseph Smith introduces certain rituals that have to get done in temples, which is why they have uh, temples all over the world. Um, if you do some of those rituals and you, and you do all the things that they say you have to do, uh, you can qualify for a, uh, an estate or a, a, a life in the heavenly places akin to God and his relationship with us, that we can have our own kind of world. And in that world, um, we'll have spiritual children and we'll be the God of that world. And, and the, the kind of implication of this is that um, what Joseph Smith revealed was that actually our God is, um, was not the first God. He was a God who has gone through this process himself. And he was once a spiritual child of some other heavenly being, and he qualified to be exalted, and he gained his exaltation, and we follow that example. Jesus follows that example. We follow that example and so we can be like him, but it's kind of this unending worlds without end, um, infinite, infinite kind of thing. So that's just to give you a nutshell version of what's going on. The gospel then for them is, um, uh, is the good news that you can become like God. The good news that, uh, that Christ has paved the way, uh, and you can understand maybe Jesus's role, he does atone for our sins, uh, in a sense that that if you think of your kind of work or your pathway to become exalted, sort of a staircase, uh, because of your sin, you you messed up the staircase. You know, you haven't made it so you can make it up. And so Jesus' atonement or his death, his sacrificial death on uh, on the cross, and, and really they, uh, they, there's a lot to their atonement. Uh, but, but through that, he's healed the staircase. So you, it's still up to you to kind of work your way up but Jesus makes it possible for you to do that. So that gives you a quick overview or, or an idea of the two stories that kind of drive Mormonism, this idea of restoration and this idea of your uh, possible or potential exaltation to become like God himself. So let me give you a quick um, basic strategy. So this is the the, the basic strategy that, that, that I want to use when I have a, a, a relationship with a LDS person and I want them to hear and understand the gospel, because this is part of the problem is because they use the word gospel, because they use follow, you know, Jesus and think the things that he said on the Sermon on the Mount are things that they pay attention to. You know, they follow, they believe he turned water into wine and all the things in the Bible, right? So, so they believe all those things. And so they think that they're Christian just like us and they have the same views. And so one of the, the important things for us to do in ministry toward Mormons is help them see that the Mormon member believes a different gospel. Um, and uh, so we'll talk about that just in a minute. Um, and then the next next piece is helping them see that because we have different gospels, one of us is in really big spiritual jeopardy. 
and uh, and uh, Galatians 1, 6 through 9 kind of helps with that. And then what, what I want to do, and, and hopefully I'll spend more time on this, but um, the, the, the next piece uh, that we want to do is be able to give reasons, give defeaters for the truth claims of the LDS church. Uh, so if you think of 2 Corinthians 10, there's that, you know, we destroy strongholds. So we, these strongholds of thought that people, that take people away, we can, we want to be able to give defeaters uh, why, why a person shouldn't believe their version. Uh, and then we also want to be able to give compelling evidence for belief in the gospel tradition, um, of tra the gospel of traditional Christianity. So we want to always be, be able to give a defense. So let me move through these, uh, briefly and, uh, I can't remember what uh, what time what time do I need to wrap up? If someone could put that in the chat for me, that would help me. So I don't go long. I don't want to belabor things. But while we go, let me tell you a few things here. Um, one, the hardest thing for folks, for many people, is to how do I get into a, having a spiritual conversation, even uh, with an LDS person. And, you know, maybe you have a friend who's LDS, or maybe you meet somebody who's LDS uh, in the world, and you want to have a spiritual conversation. Some of the things that we talk about maybe make you feel emboldened and uh, emboldened and you want to share with them. How do I start that? How do we get going? And I feel like there's a, a host of questions that maybe you can kind of keep in your in, in mind. One of my favorites is this first question here, uh, where when you learn that someone's LDS, you can ask them, what's the best part about being LDS? Very, very easy question. Uh, it helps you uh, uh, begin a spiritual conversation in a non-threatening way. You're just asking them their favorite thing about being a uh, Mormon. Because this is the kind of question that if somebody asked me, hey, Lauren, you're a Christian. What's the best part about being Christian? I would absolutely love that question. So I, I think this is a, it's a good, fair question to ask. Uh, one of their uh, um, tenants is that in it, as they qualify for that highest level, they'll have their family with them. And so many of them are very excited to tell you that their family can be together forever. And uh, so they'll, you know, be excited to tell you about that. Oftentimes when you ask somebody that, they'll want to know well, what's the best part about being what faith you are, you know, and uh, or you can just say, that's really interesting that you shared that with me. Can I share with you the best part about my faith? And that kind of gives you a, an entry into the gospel uh, and a conversation. If they've served a mission, you can you can ask them if they served a mission. You can ask them where. And you can ask them if they've met any Christians and if they ever had a, a Christian explain to them the gospel. And uh, some of them will say yes. Some of them will say no. So if they say yes, you can ask them, well, what do they, what do they tell you? And if they uh, say no, uh, you say, well, may I, you know, explain the gospel to you from a Christian perspective? And it just gives you a pretty easy way to, to begin those conversations and, and start talking to them about spiritual things that, you, that we want to talk about. Um, the next piece is, is helping them see the difference between their gospel and the gospel of traditional Christianity. Uh, Romans 10, if you have a Bible and you want to look at this, you're welcome to do it. But in Romans 10, um, Paul begins this line of, of, of talking uh, where he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's looking at uh, Joel 2.32, but he's saying that that refers to Jesus. So not only just calling on the Lord generally, but he's talking about um, the message of salvation in Christ. And he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe, and how are, are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without somebody preaching? And, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? And he says, how beautiful the feet of those who bring the good news. And so we have this opportunity as we are sent by Christ to make disciples of all nations. Uh, the sending part has happened. Jesus has sent us, and now it's just a matter of us telling them. And the telling uh, helps them. What I, what I want to accomplish is that I want to help them actually hear the Christian gospel, because if they just believe that a lot of Mormons have a, a perspective that, that, that uh, they are to us kind of what the New Testament is to the Old Testament. So they, they think, well, you know, we kind of complete or, or the, the fullness of the Old Testament is in Christ, but they also would think, that Mormonism is kind of the fullness of Christianity. It's sort of the logical next logical step. And so they would say, well, yeah, you, you guys still have the gospel. We just have more, more of it, you know? And um, because of that, they might think that on, on, on the whole, we have the same 
um, sort of teachings or gospel at play. And so they can't really choose between Mormonism and, and not Mormonism if they think that the basic tenets of salvation are the same. Uh, they just have the fuller understanding of it. Uh, so what I want to help them see is that, no, we have very radically different, that the, the biblical picture of salvation and grace is radically different. And uh, so so I, I kind of want my go-to method for that is to walk through the covenant that God makes with Abraham. If you recall, I won't go into it in detail today, but if you recall, God makes the covenant with Abraham, makes promises to him, and then he has a covenant ceremony where he takes the animals and he you know you, you cut an animal in half and you walk through the the two um halves of the body as a way to to ratify the covenant and in that covenant that god makes with abraham uh says god puts abraham to sleep he doesn't let him walk through the 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 animals instead um god walks through uh, uh as represented by that smoking fire pot god goes through and so what he's saying is i've made promises to you that you've believed in faith so you've entered into this relationship with me by faith uh, but all of the obligations to uphold the covenant that i've made these promises are completely on me it's not it's not um you know it's uh, it's, it's almost like a like a like a contract that only god signs and so he says all the obligations are mine um and uh, and uh, in the book of Romans, again, in Romans 4, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, says that, that when, um, when Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, he says uh, in 423, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for the trespasses and raised for our justification. So what Paul wants to do is say that the covenant there the, that, that we have, the new covenant that Jesus um, enacts, is like that covenant. That we enter into that covenant by faith, but that he upholds us uh, through his own righteousness. Uh, in in that covenant, and so we want them to just help see the the difference there, because for them, for the for the Mormon, uh, the gift of of uh, of God is is not a free gift. Uh, it's a gift. It's a, for them. Grace is something. This doesn't make sense to a Christian, right? But they'll say grace has to be earned. And that makes no sense. Can't earn grace. Uh, uh, it's not grace if if it's a wage, right? And, but they kind of have this this sense of. All the different things that the Mormon church says they have to do in order to uh, uh, have God's grace be sufficient for them to be able to work their way into that highest level of exaltation. They have uh, all kinds of things that are mandatory for them to do. And so we like to instead help them see the simplicity uh, of the gospel. So uh, Romans 6.23 kind of tells us again, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The free gift. And, uh, and, and there's some other verses I've got on the screen there that kind of help that. And so the whole point of this first bit is, is helping them see that we actually do have a different gospel, that we have this idea of the free gift that we receive by faith. They have a, a gospel or a, a thing that says all the things that they have to do to get it. And so um, uh, one of the ways that you know that a person is hearing you uh, as you as you say these things to them, one of the ways that they'll know that they're hearing you is they'll start objecting to things like, uh, well, doesn't that just let you sin all you want? Something like that. And I always kind of know when they start getting there, you know, this is what this is exactly the kind of thing that Paul has to respond to as he preaches the gospel. And so you know that you're you're preaching the gospel like Paul when you get the same objections sometimes that he got. And, and I'll actually tell a Mormon, well, no, it doesn't mean that at all. And we can talk about faith and works and all that kind of thing. But, but, but if, uh, and I'll tell the Mormon, I'll say, if when you preach the gospel, nobody would ever think to complain about that, then you might not be preaching the same gospel that Paul taught, because it seems like over and over again, as he preaches the gospel, he gets that and he has to and he has to say, no, uh, by no means is, is, it, is it the case that we continue to sin so that grace may abound, you know, by no means. Uh, but, uh, so you, but you know you're getting somewhere when you kind of get that same kind of a thing. They're at least seeing the difference now. So once they've seen the difference and they said, yeah, you know what, your gospel is different. Yours is a, you, you're all you're, you're just trusting Jesus and, um, and that, that trusting Jesus is uh, necessary and sufficient. Right? So they're going to think that trusting Jesus is necessary, but it's insufficient for eternal life. 
And what they mean by eternal life is uh, reaching that highest level in the heavenly places where you become exalted like God. Uh, Jesus is necessary for that because he repairs the staircase, but he's not enough. And, uh, and whereas Christianity, we say, no, 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 he's, he's, it's necessary and sufficient. And that's what's required. And so once we see that, that's a, a pretty big difference, right? Then we can uh, open up in Galatians and, and talk about um, uh, one of us, according to this verse, is distorting the gospel. Uh, and, and he says, um, if that's true, he says, if anyone preaches a different gospel than the one he preached, he says, let them be accursed. As we've said before now, so I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So I said, if we're, if we both have these different gospels, then one of us is in spiritual jeopardy. So how do we go about figuring out uh, who needs to change here? And so um, one, Christian, Christians are then enabled to um, talk with the Mormon about the importance of figuring this out. And one of the ways that we can do that is, uh, is through the one, one way is by uh, maybe uh, speaking of some of the false prophecies of Joseph Smith. So the book of Deuteronomy uh, in both chapter 18 and 13 gives us clear guidelines for how to um, uh, validate a, prof a prophet as one who speaks for God. And Joseph Smith fails that, uh, those tests. And so I've just listed here uh, three different prophets or three different um, prophecies Joseph Smith gave that are um, uh, verifiable in history and time that he missed it. So, you know, some of the things that he said, you can't test, you know, you, you, they're not time bound um, or clear if it happened or not. These are three that are very clear places where he made prophetic uh, things that did not come to pass. First Nephi 13 is, uh, is a really interesting one because here he talks about the uh, the Bible being corrupted after the apostles and uh, and after Christ's ministry. And we can look at, in, in that time when he was speaking that, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls hadn't been discovered yet, but today we can look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and we see that in them, the Old Testament has been preserved faithfully. Um, Joseph Smith claimed to be able to fix the Bible. And, uh, and so he claimed to go back and restore some of those plain and precious truths. And he added a lot of things to the Bible, like Genesis and other things. But the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, shows us that, no, actually what he added are corruptions, not, not uh, corrections. So there's uh, some false prophecies he gave. There's also problems with the Book of Mormon. Uh, one of those problems is that he claims that the ancient inhabitants of America were um, a group of people who migrated from Israel. So they should be Israelites, and yet their DNA in modern days has been shown to not be um, uh, Semitic. They're, they're uh, you know, Siberian uh, travelers, that kind of thing. So the, the, the DNA of ancient inhabitants of, of the Americas are not... Uh, Hebrew as he as he claimed they would be. Those are defeaters. He also um, changed some revelations uh, in his other scriptures from when he originally gave them. Some Mormons, early Mormons, left Mormonism as he changed his revelations to suit his own fancy. Uh, he also has another book called uh, one of the standard works called Book of Abraham, and he discovered some Egyptian texts. Uh, or some Egyptian texts were here in America on display, and some people bought them and had him uh, interpret them. Um, nobody in America knew Egyptian. He claimed to be able to read it by the power of God. And, uh, and what he said, it, it said, he actually produced the, the vignettes uh, of what he was translating, and he put little numbers over some of the figures and the people, and he told everybody what they supposedly said. Uh, but Egyptology was not at a place where anyone could check him at the time, but now they can, and everything he said was wrong. It has nothing to do with what those pictures are actually about. And so we can check him on that. That's a defeater. If he's claiming to be a prophet and interpret these texts through the power of God, and yet he's wildly off in every capacity, that should be a, a defeater. Um, also, there's philosophical problems with Mormonism. So there's uh, issues with the problem of evil in Mormonism. There's an infinite regress of their gods that's philosophically unsatisfying. Um, what I did at, at uh, the seminary there at SATS is the moral argument. I looked through just philosophically the moral argument for God's existence and just showed how Mormonism is incompatible with the moral argument for God's existence. And I think you could do very same thing for lots of natural theology. 
So most of the arguments that Christians would typically have for God's existence show not only that God exists, but also that the Mormon God doesn't. And so you can use philosophical uh, things as well. And then um, I'm, I'm going to move quickly as I, as I kind of finish things off and then hopefully can clear some things up that I was unclear on in Q&A if anyone has questions. But, uh, then, there's all, but then once you've kind of knocked down some re or given some reasons why someone um, should not believe the LDS church, we also want to be able to offer compelling evidence for the uh, belief in the gospel of traditional Christianity. And uh, 1 Peter 3.15 talks about always being willing to uh, and able to give a defense or an apology uh, for, um, for the gospel. And so we can talk about some reasons why I think that though faith in the Mormon um, gospel is uh, uh, not good and in and, and, uh, uh, not a strong foundation, but but Christianity it, it is. And one of those is again the reliability of the Old and New Testaments. So uh, we can we can see that the gospel or the, the the texts have been carefully preserved, and that's important for us. We can also look at archaeology that the people, places, and events. Many of them can be verified uh, archaeologically. That's not the case with Mormonism. In none of their scriptures and the stories and the narratives that they tell have any bearing in uh, in the world archaeologically. Uh, we can also look at church history, and, and a church history is rich, and we can see through the richness of church history that it's just not the case that the church apostas uh, apostatized after Jesus and the apostles. And, uh, and there's lots of good uh, evidence from natural theology that God exists, and so we can uh, bring that to bear on them as well. So that's... Uh, that's the gist of what I, just a very brief overview of what I wanted to share, kind of a basic strategy of helping first clarify the gospel. Um, you have that pivot moment where we talk about how one of us is in spiritual jeopardy because we're preaching a different gospel, and then give some reasons why you, you ought not believe in the Mormon version, but instead uh, have good reasons to believe in Christianity. So that's the, that's the gist, and if anyone has any questions, I'd love to uh, to maybe respond to anything you might have.